Hey folks, welcome back to the Husker Big Red YouTube channel. I'm Chris Peterson of HuskerBigRed.com and with me as always is my co-host Danny Gillette of the GreatCornholio.org and we are here on Thursday morning, one day after early signing day. We're going to talk about kind of our final thoughts and takeaways on what was a really successful day for Nebraska football. Um, Danny, it's been, you know, over a, a little over a day now since we've had this flurry of signings before we get to, you know, some of our superlatives we're going to go through here on this uh, 2020 recruiting class. Let's talk some of our uh, takeaways. And we saw Matt Rule talk about this yesterday, but what are some of your takeaways from this 2023 early signing day? This staff can recruit, and it's not just hyperbole. It's not just, oh, you know, we hope to land these kids. We'll try our best. And, you know, all the usual press conference, you know, hype that comes out of, you know, the introductory press conference. They really did go out and recruit. They really went out and recruit, and they found, um, you know, impact players and not just sleepers, but actual impact players. And, you know, they didn't reach. They had a plan. And, um, you know, they stuck to it. And I thought one of the interesting quotes of the day was um, Matt Rule said that sometimes uh, running backs coach E.J. Barthel, or was it E.J. Barthel or I think it was either E.J. Barthel or Terrence Knighton would, will text him at 3 a.m. to say, hey, hey, look at this kid that I just found or look at this kid that we should recruit. So. I think that right there just speaks to, you know, how hard this staff works. Yeah, you know, he wanted a young, energetic staff, and, I mean, I think he's got that. There's a lot of, you know, really great recruiters there. You know, Evan Cooper, you know, I think played a big role in this. Um, you know, but, yeah, EJ That's Barthel, who it was, was Evan Cooper. Yeah, Terrence Knighton, um, you know, but even Omar Hales behind the scenes. I mean, those behind-the-scenes guys, you know, play a big impact in this too, and I think that Matt Rules put a really – strong staff together and it's one that can recruit and you know we talked about this a little bit yesterday too but adding in these high school coaches from texas and florida too i think are really smart moves that are gonna you know open up those pipelines more and you know the thing i took away from from this recruiting class of this you know three week period with that matt rule has really been in charge is uh how much they're gonna value the state of nebraska and i said this yesterday on our stream but i really don't think the top players in Nebraska are going to be leaving the state of Nebraska with Matt Rule. I, I think that that's clear. You know, he's made that a priority, and I think he's going to go hard after some of these 2024 guys, you know, like Carter Nelson and, you know, some of them, Tyson Terry down the road in the 2025 class. You know, they, they want to make sure that those players stay home and then they can branch out to, you know, Texas and Florida and Pennsylvania. I think that's where we're going to see – you know, a lot of the kind of talent coming from, but, you know, in that Northeast area, Rule has a lot of connections there. But, yeah, it's a smart – you know, it's a smart strategy, and, and that's actually feels like we have a, rec a recruiting strategy for the first time because, it you know, it reminds me back to that, you know, I saw something yesterday on, the, you know, the old Herb Brooks from the, the Miracle movie, you know, and, and they – Love they, that they, movie. The, yeah, it's an awesome movie, and they go on there and, you know, he gives the guy, the assistant coach's list of players after they just started tryouts, and he's all – uh, Herb, you're missing the you're missing some of the best players, and he's like, I'm not looking for the best best players. I'm looking for the right ones. And uh, you know, with Scott Frost, it seemed like they just took the best players, whoever, based off rankings or you know, I'm not sure the evaluation process. But here, I really think they're trying to find the best group of players for Nebraska, players that want to be at Nebraska, players that fit their system. And I just think that it's you know, regardless of the ranking, which is up to number 28 right now, which is pretty impressive to have a top 30 class you know, with, with everything that, uh, you know, was facing this coaching staff and, you know, with all these guys too, beyond the rankings, I just love how it all fits together. And, you know, I do think that this is going to be a class that's going to help renew Nebraska football, as the slogan says. We have a very, you know, very varied class too. We have Malachi Coleman, who's an athlete. We have Frenchwell Umamalian, who's an edge, Riley Van Poppel at defensive line. Then you have speed at wide receiver in Jaden Doss, a whole lot of speed. Then you have, you know, a corner in Dwight Boodle and Sam Sledge, interior offensive line. You know, we have guys from everywhere who are very talented that can make an impact. It's not really – the talent's not really concentrated at one position. The talent is concentrated at multiple positions, and that's what you need to build a big uh, – you know, a good program. And I'm not saying we're going to turn into, you know, these programs like this year, but if you look at, you know, the Alabamas and the Ohio States of the world, they have depth and they have – you know, balance at each position. So in case one, you know, player goes down, it's next man up. And that's something that Nebraska hasn't had really in the past couple seasons. And I think this class is the beginning of it moving forward. 
Yeah, for sure. And, you know, it is um, interesting because, yeah, there's there's players across the board. I mean, there was a lot of guys on the offensive and defensive line, which I liked. You know, I think there was like four edge players, um, you know, four offensive linemen, a um, couple of def- uh, defensive linemen in there, Riley Van Poppel and, uh, you know, Vincent Carroll Jackson. So, I mean, I think they have a lot of really great pieces. We should say that Barry Jackson uh, did flip to Cincinnati which I think was connected to the Malachi Coleman thing. And it's really not that big a surprise. It's not that Barry Jackson's not a great player, but you can, you know, how many, how many classes do you see taking five wide receivers? That's just, that's a pretty big number. Most are at three, sometimes they're at four. And, you know, really, I think with Malachi Coleman, I mean, he's a guy that could play edge or something. I mean, you know, Michigan was recruiting him out of safety. So, I mean, he could play all of the, I mean, he could honestly grow into being a tight end, um, you know, so it's, I feel like there's versatility, but obviously I've always thought, you know, wide receiver would be his, you know, most impactful, you know, position or that or edge. Um, but I mean, even outside him, you know, Jaden Doss, you know, really promising receiver, Jalen Lloyd, Bryce Turner. I love that receiver hall. And, um, you know, I think that Quentin Ives too, you know, he's, he snuck up into the, into the composite rankings now. And, and that's because, you know, this guy can play, you know, he's a bit of productive player and, you know, I've liked how EJ Barthel was in him in on him since his UConn days. So, you know, I feel like they, they made a lot of really solid additions and, you know, like, like coach rule kind of has, has talked about a lot, you know, it's, if you're going to miss, miss on speed and miss on athletes and, and that's what they are going to do in this class. You know, they're, they're going to hit some home runs, I think. And sure. Like every class, there's going to be a kid or two that doesn't pan out. That's the way it goes. But you know, they're taking shots on a certain athletic profile and kids that have certain traits and, you know, because it's it's a really interesting philosophy, but it's basically the idea that as long as the kid has the physical ability to run and be fast and da da da, I can, you know, not me, but the coaching staff can teach him football. You can teach somebody football. You can't teach somebody how to run ten two in the hundred meter dash. I mean, you know, you you can teach a few things that help fast people run really fast. You know what I mean? But there's just certain natural traits that you you have to have, and I think that Nebraska really values those traits. And you know, we saw that in this 2023 recruiting class. And I would be curious to kind of hear Matt Rule's recruiting pitch because I was very impressed with how much talent he retained from the class that was originally part of the last staff. I mean, I was worried about losing, you know, a Dylan Rogers or a Riley Van Poppel. And, you know, they managed to stay. A lot of the in-state kids managed to stay. Sam Sledge, uh, you know, Brock Knudsen. So, you know, I would love to, you know, kind of hear what, Matt Rule's recruiting pitch to them was. And so I think it just shows that Matt Rule is a very good, you know, he connects with people. He's more than just a recruiter. He connects with people. He's not trying to BS anybody. He really is going to try to work as hard as possible. And he gives something, you know, one of my, I guess, smaller takeaways from this class was that, you know, he gives reason for players to be hopeful and want to come to Nebraska because like we mentioned yesterday his energy is just infectious I was ready to go suit up and play for him at his introductory press conference so I think that energy is translating well to the you know to the recruiting visits and you know the uh, on-campus official visits and things like that so I think there's definitely something to be said for that especially and I hate to keep referring to it but when you look at the last staff and how much of a disconnect there was in recruiting and now you have a coach that really wants to be here, loves recruiting. I don't know when he sleeps, but his effort is paying off, and I'm really impressed by that. Yeah, I think it's um, part of just who he is. As a, you know, you talked about how he connects with people. Well, there was, I was reading something about, you know, the the late, great Mike Leach, you know, uh, rest God rest his soul after he passed away last week. But, you know, he was talking about parenting and coaching, and one thing he said was that, you know, you have to be genuine because kids can smell fake a mile away, and and that's true. And, uh, and Matt Rule is genuine. I think, you know, he, he won these kids over with just his pitch and what he, you know, his passion for Nebraska. And then I think the fact that he's got a track record of, hey, look at this, you know, this kid came to me as a, as a raw athlete and look what I helped turn it into, you know, and I think he's got a lot of, you know, stories on his side. You know, Hassan like, Reddick, yeah. for example. And just a lot of guys that have been with him that, that, you know, really care about him and still want to play for him, you know what I mean? And so, you know, I just feel like he – he does it the right way. You know, he talked about that. I mean, it's easy to say that you're doing it the right way and all that type of stuff, but you know, I, he really seems to believe it. And, 
You know, I think that they're just selling Nebraska football, you know, to, to kids in Nebraska, that shouldn't be that hard, honestly, you know, it really shouldn't be that hard, but you know, there's, you know, he mentioned it, you know, playing games, we're not going to play games here and coaches have played games with kids in the past, you know, that probably deserve scholarships that they tried to, you know, sneak them into the walk on route. And I mean, I understand it with the scholarship rules, but you know, if a kid in Nebraska is good enough to play for Nebraska, then he should be on scholarship. I mean, that's just, I mean, I'm not saying that every kid is going to get one and, and sure there's a reason for walk-ons and stuff. And, you know, maybe they're just missing something here or there, but you shouldn't be judging a kid as, Hey, this is a scholarship guy that we probably could get as a walk-on. I don't, I never liked that philosophy, you know, being from Montana, they do that to kids here too, because they have limited scholarships. So they try to save them for, you know, kids from Texas and Washington, California, whatever, because, they, they're kind of banking on the fact that kids that are from Montana want to play in Montana. And Nebraska has done the same thing for a long time. And, uh, you know, I don't I'm not saying that caused them to miss on some kids, but, you know, I, they're de that definitely does cause some, uh, you know, raw feelings, especially like with high school coaches and stuff like that. So I feel like all those things paid off in the way that Matt Rule, you know, when he got to Nebraska, you know, the, after his press conference, where's the first place he went? He went to Omaha. You know what I mean? He went to Lincoln, he, you know, he, he went to these big schools and this, he wasn't flying around to Texas and Philadelphia and Pennsylvania, you know, all that stuff. He did go those places, but he went to Nebraska first. And I think that that really, you know, endeared him to a lot of these in-state recruits. And I think it's helpful that his staff seems to have a similar vision as well. I mean, you look at previous coaching staffs and Scott Frost and Mark Whipple weren't really on the same page. Mickey Joseph and Mark Whipple weren't really on the same page. Notice there's a common theme here, but anyway, um, you know, you know, Scott Frost and Donovan Rayola weren't on the same page, but it was just like there was so much disconnect with the previous staffs with their own people, the mm. own people that they brought in, <laughs> and I don't sense that with Matt Rule here. I sense that it's a very cohesive effort by this coaching staff. Everybody feeds off one another in recruiting, and you know. We'll see how this translates on the field, but the fact that they're kind of syncing up so well leads me to believe that, you know, we could, that could translate well onto the field. And it's just good to see a cohesive effort with purpose, with reason, with reason and with excitement. Yeah. And I just think the culture that Matt Rule is building, you know, one thing that was kind of cool that he sat up there and talked about, and I, I can't remember which reporter pointed this out, but, you know, he talked about how, you know, the other coaches, he, he sat there and listened to other coaches say, like, once I get my guys in here, we'll be successful. Once I get my guys, blah, blah, blah. Well, Matt Rule is up there and he said, every guy in this locker room is my guy. You know, I don't care if I coached them, if I recruit them, if they're here in this locker room as part of this team, that's my guy. And, you know, kids, kids hear that stuff. And that's, it's because it's not just a press conference type of thing. It's the way that he operates. I mean, he built really great cultures at Temple and at, at Baylor. And the guy was from, I mean, this is a, this is a Philadelphia guy who, you know, he became a favorite of the Texas high school coaches, even though he wasn't even from Texas, he had zero relationship with there whatsoever. Even when he coached at Carolina, he went back and did the coaching clinics and all that type of stuff. And this guy is really smart. I mean, he is a really smart guy. He knows how to build relationships. And, you know, those couple of things, I mean, it's just they're basic. But, you know, that's what counts in recruiting. Recruiting is a relationship business. And uh, it's about those relationships and also about what you can do kind of for that kid. And, and so, you know, I think that, you know, Matt Rule has a, has a great message to sell the parents. And I think he has a great message to sell the players. Like, this is what you know, you can come, you, this is what you can turn into. And, uh, and I'm going to help you get there at Nebraska and we're going to do it the right way. And um, so I feel really good about, you know, this class and, and the talent that he was able to add and just the, the culture that he's building guys that want to be here. I mean, Malachi Coleman, when he tweeted, you know, his uh, announcement or one of the things that he tweeted after his announcement was you have to want to be here in capital letters. And so, you know, he wants to be here and all these other guys do too. And, yeah, I mean, I'm I'm uh, I'm ready for this season. I can't wait for spring ball. I'm just excited to see these the, the product on the field. One of the things Matt Rule emphasized in his introductory press conference was family. He mentioned his own family at the podium, and he mentioned you know the football family. And I think you know that that comment, every guy in this locker room is my guy. You know, kind of aligns with that because you know that must feel really good as a player because I know as fans. There was a big debate at the time, and this seems so long ago, but it was just, you know, even this year, oh, you know, this guy's still a Riley guy, uh, you know, it's a cross problem, and, you know, this, that, the other thing. 
no, I mean, could could there be, you know, coaches, guys due to different recruiting styles? Yeah. But at the end of the day, you know, you're in the same locker room. You're all one big team. And as a player, you know, I would love to hear that everybody in the locker room, you know, is is part of the coach's family, you know, that I mean something to the coach and that he'll do whatever he can to, you know, try to make me as comfortable as possible. And I think that goes back to the family atmosphere for sure. Yeah. So it'll be, it'll be interesting to see how it plays out. And, you know, with this 2023 class, it's not done yet. I mean, we feel like Cameron Leonard maybe has signed already and it's just announcing it, you know, in the all American bowl, which I think is January 2nd or 3rd. Um, so that's something kind of, you know, recruits tend to do. Ethan nation is another cornerback that was projected uh, rivals uh, inside Nebraska had a pick there, Greg Smith, um, for him to, to come, come to Nebraska. Uh, you know, so that's going to be another one. I think he's announcing on the all American, uh, bowl, um, or whatever, you know, whatever they call that game anymore. I don't quite remember, but so those are two other names to keep an eye on chance nation and Cameron Lenhart for Nebraska. Um, they're both top 500 guys. Leonard's a four-star recruit, you know, in the 24 seven composite. Um, you know, I think there'll be some transfer information too, because basically after, I think after Friday, um, you know, recruiting's going into a dead period for a couple of weeks. Um, I think until like January 4th or something, that's when uh, transfers can kind of come up and, and make some more visits. So that's why some of those decisions may be, you know, if kids are still undecided, they might wait a little bit longer to kind of take that next visit. But, uh, but yeah, this 2023 class could still move up. I would love to see, you know, Nation and uh, Leonard commit. But but either way, it's a really great start for Nebraska football and um, seems like a good time to, to transition into some of our superlatives. So we're going to go through kind of a list of, you know, the biggest sleeper and da-da-da um, about this uh, 2023, you know, recruiting class, kind of some rapid uh, fire here. So we'll start off, Danny, with uh, looking at this 2023 Nebraska recruiting class. Who is your biggest sleeper, you know, out, out of the guys that have signed so far? Eric Fields. I mean, the fact that, you know, he's been so under-recruited blew my mind. And I know I ranted and raved about him yesterday, and I'll do it again here today. He's so fast. 108 tackles last year in 10 games. He has to be my biggest sleeper. I can't believe we got him, and I believe he'll, you know, be able to make a sizable impact very soon. Yeah, I'm going to have to agree with you, Eric Fields. I mean, it's, uh, you know, he's just... When you watch his film, you're just it blows your mind that he yeah. wasn't, you know, a three or you know, the, the dude looks like a four star recruit to me, honestly. Matt Rule even talked about him on the, you know, his press conference yesterday. He said, like, people are gonna get to know this guy. He's gonna play a lot of football. I think he's gonna play next year. I'm not saying he's gonna start over Luke Reimer and Nick Heinrich, but you know, they needed speed at the linebacker position, especially with Ernest Hauschman transferring to Michigan. Yep, too. Yeah, depth. And uh, I think he just will fit into that role perfectly. I think we'll see him on some special teams. I think we'll see him, you know, a little bit on defense next year. And, and this is a guy that I think is going to start, you know, for multiple years at Nebraska. I think he's going to have multiple, like, 100 tackle seasons. And I think this guy is going to get drafted into the NFL in a few years. So, yeah, Eric Fields, a big-time guy out of Oklahoma, just a, a huge addition late. And uh, maybe outside of Malachi Coleman, probably my favorite uh, signing these last couple of days. Okay, so this one will, uh, you know, there's obviously impact players, but, you know, this this uh, recruiting class obviously is filling some needs too. So with the need, a little bit of positional need in mind, who who do you think is going to play right away out of this 2023 class? Malachi Coleman. I mean, he's a, top, he's a top wide receiver in the class. I know this class has a lot of wide receivers, you know, Jalen Lloyd, a lot of good talent. But, I mean, I think part of the reason you come here if you're Malachi Coleman is that you're promised – you know, playing time pretty early. So I think Malachi Coleman is a guy you could see play right away, losing Trey Palmer to the NFL draft. You know, that's exciting, but it definitely hurts in terms of roster building. So I think, you know, Malachi Coleman will be able to play right away. I wouldn't be surprised if, you know, we saw him on the field, you know, pretty quickly. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I, I think we could see him out there. Obviously, when they, they go play uh, Coach Prime in Colorado and, you know, take on Minnesota in those early games, I think he is going to be out there. Wouldn't that um, be nice? A seven-touchdown game against yeah. Coach Prime. That would be great, <laughs> huh? <laughs> that would be that would be awesome. Um, but, yeah, I mean, I you know, I just look at, you know, the receiver position and there's nobody – there are some guys with speed and, the, you know, um, Geranian Bonner, you know, is – coming back from an injury. I'm not sure what the deal is with uh, 
to Coltis Crawford and those guys. But uh, we know we've got Marcus Washington and Elante Brown. Um, but there's there's nobody on this roster like Malachi Coleman, 6'5", 200, you know, can run, you know, like the wind, basically. He's got the ball skills. I know his, his high school season was kind of hampered by injuries and whatever. So, you know, make sure he gets healthy. But get this get this kid playing catch with Casey Thompson and, uh, you know, obviously Jeff Sims, too, you know, and he's in the mix. But I really feel like it's going to be hard to unseat Casey. And, um, man, it's just the idea of him throwing bombs up to Malachi Coleman is, is pretty fun. So, you know, I definitely think, uh, you know, he's a guy that's going to play right away. Um, I'm going to toss in Fields, too, because I do think he's going to, you know, be, I guess if we kind of already gave that away, you know, we were talking about him before. But, but yeah, those are two guys I think are going to play, you know, fairly early. And, and another guy is, uh, for me, is Rahir Stewart, you know, that three-star safety. He's another guy that, you know, I think should be a four-star and, just with his size and kind of his, I think he fits that kind of third safety that the staff is looking for. So it wouldn't shock me if he uh, worked his way onto the field next season. All right. So regardless of ranking, favorite signee, who, who's your favorite? Again, Eric Fields. I mean, I really, really, really like this guy. He, you know, he's a guy that I think could play right away. I'll try to think of somebody other than Eric Fields. Um, Princewell. Princewell Uma Malin, I think, would probably be my next favorite because, you know, that edge rusher position is so key these days in college football, especially with the game a little bit more offensive minded. You need good edge rushers and, you know, losing O'Shawn Mathis to the draft. You wondered what Nebraska was going to do at the position. Now they have a guy in Princewell Uma Malin that can really get after the quarterback. Um, you know, he specializes in it and you know, he's a type that can, you know, make opposing offenses lives miserable. So I really love him. And, you know, I think he was, you know, the seventh highest rated recruit that Nebraska landed out of Texas since 2000. So, you know, the, you know, the sky's the limit for him. Yeah, I would say uh, Prince Well, Yuma Malian's right up there. And then uh, probably Malachi Coleman would be my favorite signee. Just, you know, I've been, uh, a huge Malachi Coleman fan before I've compared him to Randy Moss before. Cause I think he's got that type of uh, ability. I mean, I really think, you know, and it, that's why I, I think that Matt rule is a perfect coach for, for Malachi Coleman. Cause he's a guy that's proven, you know, he can take raw talent. And that's the thing is Malachi is not a raw talent, but he's got that raw freakish athleticism. And just with a little bit of kind of molding, it's easy to see this guy being, you know, like a first, second, third round pick or whatever. He's not the only guy on this, uh, on this team either. I think that's going to be in that range, but yeah, I would say Prince, well, you mammalian and uh, you know, Malachi Coleman kind of probably tied, I guess. I, I just really like both of those guys. And um, another signing that I really like is Bryce Turner. Um, and I thought that was a, a great move to go out and get him, um, get that commitment, show that you're going to make that commitment um, in Texas recruiting. And uh, he's a guy that's six two and he runs the, he runs the hundred meter dash in like 10 to five. So you know, he's an absolute freak, um, and I think that he's going to be a guy looking back that they're like, yeah, he probably should have been ranked somewhere. You know, he's ranked as a three-star now, but he's one of those guys that I think is going to outplay his ranking at some point. So best NFL future. I mean, it's kind of, you know, there, there's a few guys on this list. Maybe should we go like one offense and one defense for best NFL future? Yeah, sure. I'm down. Why don't you go first? Because there is a lot of guys on this list that I think can make it. There are a lot of guys. So offensively, I probably already said this, but Malachi Coleman, I think he, you know, look, this is one of the most talented receivers Nebraska has ever had. And, uh, you know, he could, like I said, he could be an edge rusher too. So it would not surprise. That's where Michigan, I think, wanted him first. Then they wanted him at safety. Rule says he wants him at receiver and he could do some other things. But I just think that, you know, man, put that kid out at receiver and, and let's, let's see him make some plays. And just, I, I honestly can't remember Nebraska really ever having a, a true threat like that i know they've had some really great receivers but just a monster who can run like that i just i racking my mind i don't know anybody you know who's ever been like that in nebraska football history quite like that so he's going to be one there and then on defense um there's probably the two names that stick out to me i'm going to go with prince uh prince well you and just because the edge rusher I, I do think that eric field is going to end up being a player but you know linebackers are more mid mid-range picks he'll probably be in like the fourth round or something Princewell I think has a really good chance to develop into a second third round edge rusher you know under this staff and you know he's another guy that maybe we could see on the field next year so so those are uh, my two picks Coleman and uh Princewell for best NFL future 
I'm going to go one on offense and then I think two on defense. And, uh, you know, one of them on defense was yours. I'll go defense first. Prince Welton with Malin. You know, I think edge rusher is a key position in the NFL now. And, you know, I think his game can translate well to the, you know, big time ranks. And then I'm going to say linebacker Dylan Rogers because he just has an instinct that allows him to see the field. He can get downfield and make tackles quickly. And, you know, that's what you need in a linebacker in today's game. Teams are always looking for that solid tackler at the position. I think offensively, um, this one's tough for me because I'd say probably Malachi Coleman. I didn't want to say, you know, Coleman just because that's the obvious choice, but I think that, you know, Coleman has the brightest future. And then I don't know where he fits in terms of offense and defense, but maybe Tristan Alvano because a good kicker is hard to find these days. And, you know, if he continues at the path he's going on, he could very well have an NFL future when all is said and done. Still a lot of work to be done. I'm not I'm 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 not anointing him anything yet, but you know, he certainly has a bright future ahead of him, I think. That's a that's a really interesting one. We go towards instant impact. I know we talked about, you know, who'll play right away and, and this is uh, somewhat similar, but also a little bit different. And uh, you know, Tristan Alvano, I think, is a guy who could have an instant impact in Nebraska next season. You know, we'll see he's got to battle uh, Tommy Bleak Road, but you know, he wasn't uh Tommy missed some field goals this year. And I know another thing is uh Tristan's probably going to handle, you know, the kickoff duties. So it wouldn't surprise me if by, you know, the end of the year, you know, Tristan Alvano is the is the place kicker for Nebraska football. So, uh, you know, he's a guy that I think can make an instant impact. I think Malachi can can make an instant impact. And um, I'm not ruling out uh, Quinn Ives at, at uh, running back because, you know, running back is a position that we've seen that in college and in the pros. It's, it's one of the easiest positions to kind of translate up. And I know this guy was a little under recruited, but I really don't care because – Go look at Deuce Vaughn and look at his offer list. And he made a huge impact as a freshman. He's got the speed, you know, he's got the, and I just think he's a fit from out rule system. And so you look at, you know, Anthony Grant's obviously in the mix to start AJ Allen. And then you've got, you know, Emmett Johnson. Um, you've got, I we'll, we'll see about Ramir Johnson. He hasn't transferred yet. So I'm assuming he's going to be in the mix, but uh, you know, there's not, I, I would say, you know, with Yant leaving, there's not a huge depth of running backs and I could definitely see Quentin Ives getting himself into that mix. So, that's kind of three guys I chose, I guess. But uh, I'll just keep going on defense. Um, <laughs> I do think Eric Fields is going to make an instant impact. I think Stewart's going to, and then um, the other two I think that have a shot are Prince Well and uh, Riley Van Poppel. You just took one of mine on the last one, Riley Van Poppel. <laughs> <laughs> I, but I think you know with the, with the three three five, I think that gives him the opportunity to really shine. I think a lot of responsibility would be put on him, but I think. He's up for it. He's a tremendous athlete. Uh, his father used to pitch for the Atlanta Braves, I believe, Todd Van Poppel. So, you know, athletes run in the family. But, you know, this is a guy that, you know, is so aggressive, very physical. And that's what you need in a 3-3-5. I mean, you need aggression. You need speed. And, you know, I think that's important. And then offensively, this one's tough. I think Jaden Doss um, is a guy in terms of speed that can really make an impact. Um you know, I think when you look at the wide receiver room, there isn't a, uh, there isn't a ton of talent there. You know, there isn't a ton of, you know, returning players. But, you know, I think that'll give time for players to step up. And while we do have Malachi, I think we're going to need more help. I think we're going to need, you know, multiple guys. Because even last year, we had Marcus Washington and Trey Palmer. But who came after that? I mean, not much. So we'll see. Yeah, I'd be, you know, I still have hope for Elante Brown. You know, I don't know if I'm crazy about that, but I am excited that he kind of came back. And I'm hoping that Marcus Washington can have a, kind of a breakout season because I think he showed, you know, he, he's on the brink. And, um, you know, obviously he'll get some more chances this year. But, yeah, it's it's a wide open room, really, especially, you know, if like, I mean, but even if the coldest Crawford does, you know, transfer back, I mean, he's coming off a major knee injury, I think. So it's not like he's guaranteed to play and, you know, Camonte Grimes kind of did the same thing, but, you know, he hasn't really sniffed the field in two years. So it's like, I, th I think there's going to be a lot of competition. And I think Bryce Turner and Jalen Lloyd, I think are going to be in the mix and it wouldn't shock me at all. And I think we're going to see it next year, but I think we're going to see, you know, Casey throwing some deep balls to, uh, to Bryce Turner and Jalen Lloyd next year. Because the thing, I mean, with, 
Why go ahead, not? Go ahead. I was just going to say, I mean, why, why not with that speed and the way he can throw the football? Absolutely. And, you know, my only thing with Alante Brown is there's no doubt he has speed and there's no doubt he is a good athlete. But if we haven't heard from him by now, <laughs> then I don't know. Uh, at this point, I really don't know. Um, you know, I'm going to I, – I would have said, you know, the some of the offensive linemen, you know, commits, but I'm going to hold my judgment um, – you know, because in theory, none of these wide receivers, none of these running backs will make any impact if you don't have an offensive line. I mean, we saw yeah. it last year, but, uh, you know, quite honestly, I think anybody on the offensive line that we brought in will have an instant impact because it can't be any worse than we did last year. So, so I mean. It's it's going to be interesting. And Coach Rule said the offensive, you know, he really defended the offensive line yesterday and, and said that, you know, I – he basically called out people like me and you and everybody that's been trashing the offensive line and saying like, you know, he, he knows the offensive line is going to be bit. Well, it can't be worse, but you know, it, it would be the bar's not set really high. Well, <laughs> no, but it, it'd be interesting though. Wouldn't that be interesting if he took the same group of guys and then they went out and played, you know, fairly well. I mean, what an indictment that would be of the previous staff, but we we've seen that before. I mean, I know I talk about Michigan a lot, but when they came there, you know, in Jim Harbaugh's first year in 2015, they had a few, they got a few transfers, but it was mostly the same guys who were getting their asses beat with Brady Hoke. And I don't know what he did, but he flipped the switch and they won 10 games. I'm not saying that can happen here, but the right coach and the right system and the, and all that stuff, uh, it really can make a difference sometimes. Well, when you look at some of these line recruits from, you know, 2019, 2020, they were all really highly rated players. I yeah. mean, something just, well, I mean, they weren't coached properly, but other than that, and that's a I like how you thing. said something went wrong, and then I could see that well, you just saw the face of Scott Frost into your in your mind. Yeah, 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 <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, <laughs> exactly, but like it just doesn't add up. Like even with a even with a poor coach, you should be able to see something that you know resembles a four star recruit. They don't have to be all Americans, but there's got to be at least something there. And there was an obvious disconnect, and you know it's it. It, it wasn't just Scott Frost. I think it was Greg Austin. I, I You know, I'm not ready to pin it on Rayola yet because to use one of your favorite phrases, he had to make chicken salad out of chicken shit. And quite yeah. honestly, the line played better towards the end of the season. So, you know, it just doesn't when, – when you looked at the line rankings, it, you know, it didn't really make sense how they could even be as bad as they were just because of how highly rated they were. Yeah, I mean, especially Benhart and, and uh, Corcoran and, um, you know, it's it's going to be interesting, though, because if you think about it, um, you know, I know that we're missing, you know, Hickson, I believe, has graduated in Bando, but they're getting, um, I'm, I always forget the guy's name, Nuelli or however you pronounce it, I, you know, but anyways, Nuelli he started. Yeah, yeah, yep, so he'll be back at guard. I mean, so really, if you're looking at it, you've got, um, you know, do you have to replace your center position, um, you know, tackle, I think, you know, they're going to be okay. I'm trying to, Prajaka is going to obviously come back and, you know, Ben has got to step up. Sorry. He's got to step yeah, up. Yeah, he does. Him and Corcoran have to absolutely step up because those two are the first two I think of when I think of players who have underperformed. They have to both step up. And maybe Noelle had the right idea when he, I think it was a drug test, right? Maybe he had the right idea with the steroids <laughs> or whatever because yeah. <laughs> Prajaka and Corcoran certainly didn't take any. Hey man, if you're not cheating, you know, if you're not cheating, you're not trying, right? In some ways. Uh, but <laughs> yeah. I see, I, yeah, it's funny with Prajaka because I do feel like when he, before he got hurt as a freshman, I feel like he played some, some decent football. And last year he was terrible, but I think they just, I think they tried to rush him back. I don't think he ever looked right to me. And, um, you know, I always think of uh, Corcoran and Ben Hart, but I feel like, you know, if Corcoran, I think, is out of position at left tackle, I think he's better at guard. And if they could get, um, Prajaka to play at left tackle and be healthy and uh, Corcoran could bump inside the guard and then find a center they might not be that bad you know him I thought that Henry Lovtoski actually played pretty well at times last year so he's kind of like one of the younger guys I, I feel pretty good about um yeah and you know I, I like some of these I really like Mason Goldman I really do um you know six six um you know I, I you know Knudsen um all these guys I think are going to have an opportunity to compete but I really would like to see a transfer, especially that center position. And we were hoping for Ben Scott. And, you know, there was John Callahan, I think, did a prediction that he didn't think he was going to come here. But it's it's really tight. I know uh, UCLA's in the mix, but I really feel like that's 
you know, if we're talking about like positions that they still need to hit in the transfer portal, I feel like O line at center and depth, you know, at the tackle position are really are really, really key positions, maybe the two most important positions left for Nebraska because they filled a lot of other needs in the portal already. Yeah, and I'm wondering if more like smaller moves are gonna come with that. But yeah. um you know, the line again, not to go too off topic here, but the line I'm very curious as to how it's going to play out and i know people say oh spring ball is only spring ball it's you know it's not real prices stuff like that but the work for the line in my estimation begins in spring ball because they are so far behind in comparison to some of the other positional units i mean granted all the positional units should be you know working hard in spring ball but for the line you know i think it's extra important to kind of get everything going during spring ball and i think it's also important for donovan rayola because i know there was a lot of scrutiny when he was hired back and i don't think it was all his fault but you know he if he doesn't work out this year for whatever reason i don't see it, you know why matt rule would you know be forced to keep him so i think it's a big year for the entire offensive line coaches included and it starts in spring ball yeah i think one thing about matt rule is uh you know in the past he's he, he's not gonna I don't think he's going to pull a Scott Frost, and if this doesn't work, he's not going to never fire Eric Shenander, for instance. You know, I just don't – I don't think he works that way. And so, you know, I, I really think um, Rayola got hired. And I think it was interesting, too, he was talking about it. He said, you know, I was interviewing these other coaches and stuff, and he just kept showing up to work. He was doing his thing. And, you know, I think he said he liked his vibe, too. And I think that that had as much to do with it as, you know, um, you know the football stuff. And I just think that they have – he found a connection there. They they have similar philosophies for coaching the offensive line. And um, so, you know, hopefully it works out better for Rayola. But if it doesn't, if this group struggles, I think that Rayola is going to be, you know, gone pretty quickly. And that's, you know, Matt Rule knows he has to win here. I mean, this isn't everybody is all, you know, everybody's on the Matt Rule train right now. But, you know, if you don't have a winning season next year, then it's a lot of pressure going into year two. I mean, that you know, the, you get basically in these kind of jobs, you get like one year you know, as the, uh, you know, grace period or whatever. I mean, look at Brian Harson and Auburn, you know, he got one year to suck and then he was gone. And I'm not saying that Matt rule is going to be like that at all, but you know, it's, if you don't win that first cup, those first two years, I mean, that pressure starts to mount. So I'm, I'm hoping that they, I do think that they're going to win next season. I said this. The um, schedule is very favorable. Yeah. And I think there's six wins. I said this, you know, when that was the first, I was sitting there getting ready for bowl season, I think, last Saturday, and I said, damn it, next year Nebraska's going to be in one of these games. So I really believe that, um, you know, because they were really close this year. But getting that offensive line turned around is going to be key. At the same time, though, I don't think Matt Rule is going to sit there and let it fail. You know, he's going to take action if, if Rayola doesn't work out. However, the other thing I like about this staff, though, is it's not just Rayola. Matt Rule has coached offensive line in the he's coached offensive and defensive line, um, but he coached offensive line in the NFL for the Giants, which is where that um, connection with Rayola kind of comes through. Um, you know, Ed Foley's been an offensive line coach. Marcus Satterfield has coached offensive line in the NFL. You know, the offensive coordinator, and so I feel like all those things. I just feel like as a staff, they know how important it is, and I feel like it's going to be an all hands on deck type of thing. Absolutely, and it's also helpful to just have multiple eyes looking at something because yeah. it's easy when you're doing your own thing, you know, to kind of just, you know, stick with what you're doing and think it's good, but it's also good to get feedback from other areas, and is the feedback hard to accept sometimes? Yeah, I've been there, but, you know, it's it's good to have a collaborative effort, especially with with a unit that struggled as much as it did, you know, one guy you know, it's a lot to ask for one guy to fix four years of mess. So I think the combination of all the coaches on the staff is going to be a really good thing. Yeah. And uh, another thing too, you know, it's uh, with offensive line, I feel like it's, you know, obviously coaching matters at every position, but especially with line play, good coaching really matters because it is about your technique and it's about, you know, I actually was an offensive lineman in high school. I've coached offensive line, you know, in my, coaching background that was always my position because that's what I played and uh you know that it's your footwork your hand placement all these little things that I mean yeah and then if you've got the talent where you're six eight you got those freaking long arms and stuff that you, you know the footwork but if your technique is off you know you're just you're not going to play very well so I really I mean and I think we've seen that you know time and time and time again I mean there's a reason why you know the Patriots when they were really good 
it's because they had, you know, a, we, I've mentioned his name before, but Dante Skarnecchia. And that's, be, you know, and the Patriots weren't sitting there drafting a bunch of first round picks, but they, but he got the best out of those players. And that's why I feel like if the offensive line coaching can improve, and even, even if it's a matter of rule helping, you know, Donovan Rayola improve as a coach, because that is a thing too. I feel like good coaches, I've said this before, but good coaches develop not only their players, but their staff, right? And Scott Frost that, you know, it's not like, you were seeing guys that are like, oh, we want the, you know, we, we want to hire Eric Shenander away or blah, 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 blah. You know, there wasn't guy. I mean, obviously it helps with you when you win, but I feel like Matt Rule, it's going to be a good problem. But we're going to have coaches hired off this staff to go other places in a year or two because there's some bright young minds here. And I feel like he also gets that it's not just about the development of my players, but it's about the development of my coaches because they're the ones that are, are developing the players too. So go, it all goes hand in hand. And you know, it's all about having a true program, and that's what Matt Rule's going to build here, an actual program that's going to win games. Honestly, if you want my opinion, I see Tony White being one of the first to go. He's a very hot yeah. assistant name. I'm surprised that he that Nebraska was even able to land him, but, you know, time will tell in terms of how he does, but this was a very, he's a very, you know, respected up-and-coming name in the coaching circles, so, you know, I think it is going to be a good problem to have, but I also trust Matt Rule to make good replacement hires. I feel like, you know, I wouldn't trust Scott Frost to make a good replacement <laughs> hire. I don't uh, think he made a. I don't think he made a good hire yeah. in his entire staff. I I'm mean, trying to think. Uh, Beckton, I think. I, yeah, I, I, Beckton. I, I, like I liked Rude too. I liked Barrett Rude too, but you know, because I, mean, I think the strength and conditioning. You know, I think the strength and conditioning was not good. So I think that led to a lot of injuries at the tight end position. But anyway. I mean, and honestly, if you really want to talk about the most important person on the staff, I think the uh, strength and conditioning coach <laughs> yes. is going to have a lot of work to do. And I think, you know, some That's players a big may position. not like it. But <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's huge. Some players may not like it, but boy, <laughs> do we need to get up to speed there. And yes, I know I'm fat and I'm sitting in a wheelchair, but hey, you know, I'm not playing football. So there you go. Yeah, I didn't sign my life. I didn't sign my life away to practice. <laughs> to practice. Yeah, it's uh, that's what I wasn't good enough to play college football, you know. But like honestly, if they asked me, I would have been. Uh, it's a lot of f football practice is hard, man. So you know, I liked the coaching side of it. Not that that's easy, but it's a lot easier when you say like, "Hey, you guys have to run some sprints." It's a lot funner to be the guy with the whistle than being on the line running them. So I'll just say, <laughs> back in the day when uh, when when I used to move in with my football team for. Uh, summer camp and it was time to do sprints it was always the old lineman that threw up first so yeah it was kind of funny to watch as i was sitting in my chair eating the cheeseburger but <laughs> you know i don't think it was funny for the guys running those sprints let me tell you that as a as an old lineman too it was always funny because so like the receivers and quarter their their warm-up for practice is like playing catch and our warm-up for practice was like we had these two guys that played college football that were like 300 pounds and they would hop on the big sled and we had to yep. push the sled yep. and then we had to go under this thing to do combo blocks and if you stood up too tall it would like clothesline you so like our you're going, did the exact same yeah. thing yeah so it always pissed me i'm like yeah football practice must be fun for you quarterbacks you don't do shit all you do is play catch all day you know <laughs> the kickers too i used to hang out a lot with the punters and the kickers yeah. and you know, it was an easy life. I could have been a punter and a kicker if my legs were a little bit better. So that's what I should have <laughs> trained my, you know, get the, uh, get the punting going. But anyway, um, hey, punters yeah, are it's, people uh, too. So they are, and we we've got, you know, we've got actually we do have a good punter in uh, Brian Buschini. Who's is he uh, coming back? Yeah, he yes, is coming back. Yep, right. he is. Yeah. He is. We should, you know, yeah, he's a Helena guy. Um, Hel he played uh, Helena Capital here, which is where I live in the city of Helena, the capital of Montana. And so, if you're wondering why he punts so well, it's because he's used to kicking and zero degree weather Did another in montana guy win uh punter of the year uh yeah this, yep. this year? yeah wow yep so yeah wow. that's our claim to claim to fame um but yeah I, you know he'll be back in alvano i really am excited about tristan alvano you know i think he's gonna be i thought that was a great pickup and uh i just feel like you know even if he doesn't win the job this year for like the next three years we can actually feel pretty confident he in will. the in the at kicking point, operation yeah. and that's huge I mean, that's really huge to know, like, look at Michigan with Jake Moody and their kicker. I mean, it's just, it makes a big difference. And, you know, frankly, if, I mean, look, if Nebraska had, you know, and I'm not saying that Tristan, Obama, but say that, you know, they had him, you know, two years ago, um, you know, this Scott Frost probably would still have this damn job because they would have yep. beat Oklahoma. Um, they probably would have beat Michigan State. 
And if they would have had Bushini, they definitely would have beat Michigan State, for Christ's sake. The guy punted the – not Bushini, but whoever the punter was then. Oh, punted wow. The side oh. Of the field. At any rate. That was a really long name, too, I remember. Uh, oh, I can't remember his name, but do you think Tristan Alvano would have attempted the onside kick at Northwestern? Uh, hopefully not. Probably yeah. not. He I probably don't know. would have had enough sense not to. He might have. He might have hit it. You know, and that actually wasn't a bad kick. It just didn't didn't get executed. But uh, well, you know. it was a stupid thing to do. And it it was. It was a really about, stupid thing to think do. Think about you know, in four months, we've gone from a promising season with Scott Frost to interim yep. head coach Mickey Joseph to a head coaching search, and now we're sitting here with a class that ranks 60th just a week ago with a new class that ranks outside the top 25 at 20, 28, 28, 28 with a new head coaching staff that, you know, just started recruiting like three weeks ago. I mean, what a whirlwind. I mean, it's not, it, 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 it hasn't always been pretty, but given all of that, I like where the program sits right now. Yeah, honestly. And, you know, Matt rule, I just think, you know, I wasn't, I honestly, when I first heard the name, um, I wasn't sold on him. I didn't, you know, it, and this was before, you know, the, the kind of coaching process, but the more I looked into him and the more I looked at all of his experience coaching and his experience on the line, I just thought, God, if Nebraska is going to, I mean, a head coach that's been an offensive line coach, like what a perfect fit for Nebraska. And uh, it's been, it's been better than so far. He's been better than I could have imagined. I just didn't, I didn't realize he was, this good, strong of a recruiter, you know, and people, and, and it's not just because of him being a dynamic person, but it's just the way he kind of marshals his forces and uses his people and the, and the resources and um, Nebraska football's got, you know, as much, as many resources basically as any program in the country, you know? And uh, so there's a, there's a lot to sell here. And I think he's going to, I think we got the right guy to turn this thing around. And so it was a long, it was a long, 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 painful, you know, suffering that we went through the Riley era and the frost era. But I think, you know, in a few years, we're going to look back at that and we're just going to look at that as, as part of the journey and, and Nebraska football is going to be back where it should be. And even and that doesn't all mean the, national championships folks, but <laughs> and even all the events I just listed, that was yeah. only four months ago. <laughs> that yeah, was, it's, it's crazy. Remember how I said Matt rule back in September. Remember how I said that in one of the streams here? Yeah. Yep. I got to give myself a pat on the back. I'm not going to gamble anytime soon or bet my money, but I'll give myself a pat on the back for that one. <laughs> and uh, I'm going to, yep, I'll give you a pat on the back and Trev Alberts because he did he did a hell of a job. And, uh, you know, he the way he managed that search and, you know, I, I don't know everything that went on beyond the scenes, but, uh, you know, there was a couple times where it didn't look like, like Matt Rule was going to happen. And Trev, I just, it, it seemed like Trev, that was his number one guy from the start. And, and the, there's a, a reason for that. And, I'm just We're seeing the reason right now. Yeah, and I'm just thankful that Trev was able to to make that move. So, so Nebraska football is in a good it spot. It yep. is. He was so close-lipped, and you know, I think with some of the uh, individuals in the athletic department who maybe talked a little bit too much, I was worried that something would leak out and it would be a mess. But yeah. <laughs> Trev, <laughs> Trev, you know, kept it very close to the vest, and for that, I give him credit for it. Because even with the Nebraska media, I I, I won't include us in this, but. Uh, even with some of the, you know, pain in the ass Nebraska media, they're always looking for scoops and clickbait stuff. So, you yeah. know, I'm glad he was able to keep it away from them too and, you know, kind of just let the process and everybody who's supposed to be in the process play out. Yeah, and you know, I just – I feel really good with, uh, you know, we've got a good athletic director, I think, in Trev Alberts, and there, you know, there's just cohesiveness, I think, between – and not just the football program, but I think some of these other programs. But you just – when you have a head football coach and an athletic director and a president who are all on the same, you know, kind of wavelength and the same train of thought, I think that that really makes an impact. And so it doesn't guarantee anything. These recruiting classes don't care any – guarantee anything but from what we can judge so far it's been uh, it's been really great for matt rule and um i guess on that note let's hold up you know we did throw out some grades yesterday at the end of our stream but for anybody who missed that you know after a day to think about it more let's let's give a a final grade so far for early signing day i know we've still got some more recruits to come but uh i think i can have a guess but danny what's your letter grade for early signing day nebraska so far hey given where they were three weeks ago and Given the amount of positions that were taken care of, as well as how many states were covered uh, in this recruiting class, in absolute A, the staff did their homework. They landed, you know, key impact guys that can play right away, and it's exactly the type of recruiting class 
for a program that needs to, you know, build from the ground up. And, you know, kudos to the staff. They deserve some rest now. Whether they, they, whether or not they will actually rest yeah. remains to be seen, but they deserve rest now. Yeah, I'm sure they're all breaking down the film of other 2024 guys yeah. and transfer portal. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, I got to give it an A. You know, honestly, I, I would have been happy. Anything in the top 40, I think, would have been an, a solid achievement for this class. You know, anything in the top 50, I wasn't really even worried about rankings. I thought they were going to hit the transfer portal hard. And, um, you know, all these commitments that they got, and it's interesting, too, with you know, so we heard about, you know, all oh, these guys not ranked, blah, blah, blah. Well, everybody that they've they've got signed is now ranked as a three star and is, is kind of trending up. So, you know, they got they signed eight kids in the state of Nebraska, the most in like 30 some years. Um, and they got Malachi Coleman, the number one guy. They got uh, Prince William Mamalia. I mean, so they got four stars at some key positions. You know, you can you know, it's not like you need four stars everywhere, but you know, you need some four star edge rushers. I mean, and you need some, you need some guys on offense who can run away from people who can make people miss, who can just, when they get the ball in their hand, they make things happen with it. Malachi Coleman is one of those guys. Um, and then I like just the, the overall speed. I mean, the idea that this team could be, uh, you know, kind of built on speed, you know, in a couple of years is a really exciting thought and it's going to be needed with, UCLA and USC coming in, but, but man, if you can mar that or match that speed and marriage that up with the, you know, dominating the line of scrimmage, you know, you can win a lot of games in the big 10 for sure. One of the names I'll just bring up really quickly is actually, I believe our highest rated transfer is Josh Fleeks from Baylor. I mean, he brings that speed to the class and I feel like he's been one of the more, you know, guys that really hasn't gotten a lot of uh, recognition, but that was also a huge get and, you know, when I think of speed, I think of guys like Fleeks, Jeff Sims, you know, Fields, uh, you know, Lloyd, you know, Chief guy, Borders on defense. Chief Borders, yeah. Chief you know, Borders. Big and like, fast. That's what we need because there were some times, I'll just be honest, it looked like the linebackers in the defensive line was walking in cement. So that's yep. what we need. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, so it's going to be fun to watch. There's still a lot of questions up in the air, you know, with uh, with this roster, Garrett Nelson, some other transfers. But, uh, you know, we'll have you here covered at the Husker Big Red YouTube channel. So make sure you hit that subscribe button so you don't miss any of our videos. You know, make sure you like it. Get in the comments section. You know, we comment back on basically every comment. So, you know, get we love to talk Nebraska football. So, you know, let us know what you think. Your letter grade about this recruiting class. And as always, go Big Red. Go Big Red.